Amen. Amen. Keep your uh, place in 1 John chapter 5. That's a great chapter right there in the Bible. Not that all chapters aren't great in the Bible, but especially with what we're going to be talking about this morning. So it's kind of a, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, you preach hundreds of sermons and, and you get up, but here's a sermon where it's like you're not talking about a doctrine or you're not talking about uh, a sin or anything specific like that. You're, you know, preaching a sermon trying to describe God himself is kind of nerve-wracking, you know. It's like, boy, I hope I get this um, correct, but we'll just stick straight to the Bible this morning. And what we're going to talk about this morning is the, the subject of the Trinity, the subject of the Trinity. You look down at 1 John chapter 5, and actually look at verse number 6 um, in the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, and look at verse number 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, capital S, that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So notice how the Bible says there the Spirit is truth. I'll bring that up later. And then in verse number 7 is really the subject of this morning's sermon. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So the topic of the Trinity. Now, me personally, I have always believed in the traditional Trinity. This was not something that's been difficult for me to really wrap my head around because I just kind of grew up um, that way. I didn't grow up with a lot of Bible prophecy being uh, raised Lutheran, but as far as the Trinity goes, it was just something that was always taught, always believed. Um, and so I kind of have to like think back and kind of think organically to, to realize what, you know, the difficulty people have wrapping their head around this. But let's just look at what the Bible says. So first of all, there's this idea of, and I'm going to explain to you why I believe people have a hard time understanding the Trinity itself towards the end of the sermon. But the Bible here in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7 says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Let's pray. Amen. That's the Trinity right there. So there's three that bear record in heaven, three witnesses, you could say, Three persons, some people say, and I do believe, you know, some people say you shouldn't say persons, but the Bible actually says persons, I'll show you that um, in uh, a few minutes, you know, personalities, you know, okay, now people will start to come after you if you start saying personalities and thing, things like that. Basically, there's three witnesses, there's three distinct persons, you want to call them witnesses, whatever, that make up one God, is what the Bible teaches. And that's really the Trinity, right there. And, uh, you know, it's, it, people are confused about the Trinity, not because of the three witnesses or the three persons, because those are described in great detail in the Bible, and we'll go through that um, this morning. But people are confused about the Trinity because of the nature of God, and because of the being of God. And I'll explain that, why people are confused, and why it's actually okay to not completely understand that in your life. But I'll talk about that at the end. So look. It's, um, it's three distinct persons. I, that's what I've always said. In, in um, the Trinity, that make up one God. We don't worship three gods. You know, the Muslims will say, oh, you worship three gods. No, it is one God, three distinct witnesses, persons, parts, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, pick, pick whatever you want. Look at Malachi chapter 2. Let's start to understand this just a little bit. We're going to go through these three um, distinct parts of God, three different uh, persons of God, uh, in some detail this morning. Look at Malachi chapter 2. And look what the Bible says in verse number 10. Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 10. So, we don't worship three gods. That's the first thing. The Trinity does not mean three gods. We are not polytheistic, as the Muslims would say. Um, we worship one God. Look at Malachi 2.10. Have we not all one father? So the Bible here is saying, you know, you have one father in your life, like one physical father. Nobody can possibly have more than two fathers, like a biological father. And, and then he compares that. He says, hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our father? So he's saying, look, we have one God, okay? One God, and it is this three parts or three distinct persons that make up that God, not three gods. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at kind of the top of the Godhead, as, I, as I've always looked at it, which is the Father. We'll look at the Father first. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 in your Bible. So we have one God. We do not have three gods. We have one God made up of three persons. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 6. 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 6. The Bible says, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now turn to 1 John chapter 4. So we have one God and Father of us all, who is above all. Look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. So of the Godhead, we kind of have the top of the Godhead, which is the Father. Look at 1 John chapter 4. The Bible says in 1 John um, 5, 7, it says there are three bear, that bear record. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and the Holy Ghost, it says in 1 John chapter 5. Look at 1 John chapter 4. And we have seen, in verse 14, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So we haven't even brought, I haven't even really brought the Son into this yet, but the point is, is that the Father is the one that did the sending. Okay, the Father, in the Trinity, we have one God made up of the Word, you know, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and we're going to get into the Word equating to the Son here in a few minutes, but the Father is the one that does the sending. Okay, that is a key. You know, he sent the Son to do a job, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Look at Isaiah chapter 64. We're looking at the Father here. The Father. So, first of all, the Father is the one that does the sending. He does the sending of the Holy Ghost. He does the sending of the Son. And we'll see how, you know, the Word um, relates to the Son in a few minutes. Look at Isaiah chapter 64. Look what the Bible says in verse number 8. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are the work of thy hand. So here the Bible says, and this is kind of um, this is kind of key to my understanding of the Father, and I'll show you that um, towards the end of the sermon. But go to Genesis chapter one. So here the Bible says that the Father is the potter. He's the one that you know creates the pot, and we are the work of thy hand. Now, God the Father actually created the universe as well. Go to the very first uh, verse in your Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, and I'll show you the Trinity in the first three verses of the Bible right here. It's really interesting that as we have this God that is made up of three parts or three persons, that verse number 1 of the Bible, verse number 2 of the Bible, verse number 3 of the Bible, you can find the Trinity in those three verses. So God the Father created the universe. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is talking about God the Father right here. I'll explain to you why I know that in a couple verses. God the Father is in verse number one. It says, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It's interesting that water was already there before the, you know, that's a whole other sermon in itself. You all know how um, much I like water. But um, I'll preach a sermon on that in a, in a few weeks, on just water itself. But the Spirit of God, before the universe was formed, before God started the creation, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, was moving upon the face of the waters. And then look in verse number 3. So we see God the Father in verse number 1. We see the Spirit of God, or the Holy Ghost, in verse number 2. And look at verse number 3. We see, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. In verse number 3, we see the Word of God. Yeah. So we see all three parts of the Trinity in the first three verses of the Bible. And I said, the Father created the universe, but here's the thing. How did, how did God the Father create the universe? He literally spoke it into existence. Now this being of God, I always thought of, of the potter, as we just read in Isaiah 64. He's kind of the architect. He's kind of the mastermind of the whole situation. And then he has, I mean, it's really simple to think about God in just this sense. In the first three verses of Genesis, I should just explain this in the next two minutes, and we should end the sermon, and none of you would be confused about anything. But basically, you have God the Father, who's the architect, the potter of the whole thing. He's going to create the universe. The Spirit of God is out on the waters. We kind of need to explain what the point of the Spirit of God is. And then we have number three, God said. We have God's literal words. Okay, so that is God, right there. That is the Godhead that has three parts. You have God the Father, He has words, and He also has a spirit. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's the God. It's not complicated when we start in that way. Now let's look at, now we know who God the Father is, let's look at His word that we see in verse number three. 
Let's look at his word. His word in the beginning, you know, the Bible says that God created the heaven and the earth. And these are the literal words of God, by the way, that you're reading about in, you know, um, Genesis. These are the literal words of God. How did God actually create the world? So God created the world in Genesis chapter 1. And how did he do it? Well, he literally spoke it into existence. Now, this is where people get confused. I mean, if you look at verse number 3 of Genesis, it says, and God said, and then there was life. And God said, and then there was firmament. And God said, and then there was creatures. And that's how God created the whole universe. If you just read through Genesis, it's just, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. See, God's word, and you have to understand, this is why people get confused about God, is because people want to compare God to themselves. And the thing is, God's word works differently than your words. Man. You know, you can't create things with your words. Right. You know, God, his word is so powerful that God says, you know, let there be a zebra, and there's a zebra. Just like that. You know, I can't do that. You know, I can't say, you know, let there be a dog, and a dog appears. You know, I'm just a man with words that mean nothing. God's word is different. God's word has great power. Think about that next time you're not reading the Bible. God's word has literal power. He literally spoke this entire universe into existence with his actual word, capital W, okay? So, the word was always there. It was always there with God the Father. That's another thing that you need to realize, that the word was always with God. It was always with God the Father. And it's how, it's, it's what he used to create the world. Okay, turn to Psalm chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33, look at verse number 6. Psalm 33, look at verse number 6. Psalms, right in the center of your Bible in the book of Psalms. Psalm 33, look at verse number 6. Look what the Bible says. It says, by, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and by the host of them, by the breath of his mouth. Again, showing us that God created, I mean, he created the sun and the planets and all these things by just speaking, and he created them. So it was the word of the Lord that created the universe, and created the, what we call the creation. Now, let's build on that word. Okay, go to John chapter 1. Let's build on that. We're talking about the word. You know, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So we've talked about the Father. He's the potter. He's the one in Genesis chapter 1 where it says, you know, he created. He created everything. And he did, he did the creation. He made the creation by speaking it, by using his word. Go to John chapter 1 and look at verse number 1. Now, John chapter 1 and verse number 1 just reinforces Genesis. It just reinforces the story of the creation. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Here's another thing about, you know, God that you have to realize is that His Word is not just, you know, when I say, when I speak words up here, I just, I'm throwing out these sound waves and, you know, they're just, they're just, and, you know, they're just words. From a man, right? But God's word is God. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 1. You have to understand that the word of God is different than your words. Right. And that it's easier to understand the Trinity itself. You know, the words that God have, you know, they have literal power and they are literally God. Right. Okay? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Kind of like my words are with me, right? My words are with me, but guess what? Here's an extra on God's word. And the word was God. Amen. So the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. This is saying that the Word of God was always God. It was always with God. It was not something that was created. It was just, it was always part of God. That's it. Okay, now look at verse number three. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that, anything made that was Made. Again, showing us the importance of the word and the emphasis on it. And again, in verse number three, talking about how God, the Father, just created the entire world using his word. Okay? Now look at verse number 14. Now is where Jesus comes in. Now we see the tie between Jesus and God himself. Look at verse number 14. Where did Jesus come from? Where did Jesus come from? Why do we believe what we believe 
about Jesus. Why do we believe different than the Jehovah's Witnesses believe? And it's right here in John chapter 1 and verse number 14. We've already seen that the Word of God and it was there with God in the beginning. We've seen in 1 John chapter 5 that God has three distinct persons that are part of this one God, and one of those is the Word. The Word was used to create the entire world. The Word is mentioned as being God Himself. And look at verse 14. And this is what God did 2,000 years ago. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, this is John the Baptist, saying, This is of him who I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So Jesus physically came after John the Baptist, but John the Baptist says he was before me, because he was from the beginning of the world. Because he is literally the word of God turned into a man, is what the Bible is saying here. And of his fullness have all we received grace for grace, for the law, who are we talking about, verse 17? For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about the man. The word was made flesh in verse 14. is talking about the man, Christ Jesus, in verse 17. Okay, Jesus Christ is God's literal word manifest in the form of a man. Amen. So saying that Jesus is God's literal word is correct. Right. That is correct. Look, the Word, the Word created the universe. Amen. Okay? The Word created the universe. God's Word didn't create Jesus. Right. That's a difference, okay? So God used His Word to create all of creation. Everything that you've ever seen or ever will see was created using God's Word. Using God speaking it into existence. But His Word actually became Jesus. Right. right. His word didn't create Jesus. Amen. His word is Jesus. Amen. Saying that this Bible, these words are Jesus, is correct. That's right. Amen. That is what the Bible is saying in John chapter 1. He is the only begotten Son of God, is what was created. The word becoming flesh. The brightness of God's glory. Look at verse... Um, look at verse... Go to Hebrews chapter 1. I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 1. A lot of Bible here. A lot of Bible here. We can just read Bible for hours and hours and hours on this. So he wasn't created by the Word. He is the Word. Okay? Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. God, this is talking about God the Father, right here in verse number 1, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So it's God the Father speaking... That's Jesus, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. You see that? That right there is equating Jesus to the Word. Right. Because we saw how God created the universe and the creation through his Word. I'm just going to keep repeating this because you need to equate the Word with Jesus. Okay? And in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 2 does exactly that it was by the Son, the Son by whom also He made the worlds. You see that? The Son, Jesus, created the universe because He is the Word. Does that make sense? If A equals B and, and B equals C, A equals C. That kind of logic. Okay, that's what that's what Hebrews chapter one and verse number two did. Who? Look at verse number three. Who? This is talking about um, the Son now. Who, being the brightness of His glory, the Father's glory. Now, here's why it's okay to say persons in the Trinity, right here. Okay, a lot of people say, well, it doesn't, you can't say persons. Well, you know, the Bible says it, so right. how else are you going to describe something other than just using Bible words? How else are you going to describe something that's not really mortally describable except using the Bible words? So, who being the brightness of his glory? So this is saying Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, is what this is saying. And Jesus is the express image of of his person, of the Father's person. You see that? So the Father, the Father has a person, and Jesus' person is an image of the Father. Amen. Okay? And upholding all things by the word of his power, and he had made himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand 
This is Jesus. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty. That's the Father. Okay? So the majesty here is the Father. So Jesus, he's the express image of the Father. He's the Word become flesh. And he now sits at the right hand of the majesty of the Father. So he sits at the right hand of God in heaven right now. Okay? Look at verse number 4. Being made so much better, talking about Jesus again, being made so much better than the angels, and the hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So Jesus is the Son of God, but more importantly, he is the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so God is the Father, God the Father, he sent Jesus the Son by making his word become Jesus. Okay, manifest, and, and he's, he's the brightness of God's glory. He's the brightness of God's glory, he's the image of his person. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Turn to Luke chapter 22. So there's a huge difference here. Jesus is God, as 1 John 5, 7 would say, because he's the word. He's the word. Okay? Now, the Jehovah's Witness would say, yeah, Jesus is not God. Though. But the, the Bible says, actually, I'll just read for you, John. Uh, Jesus literally, in John chapter 5, verse 18, he made himself equal with God. That's why he was killed by the, by the Jews. Because he made himself equal with God. He made himself God. That's what he did. In um, Colossians 2... You know, the Bible, again, talks about Jesus being God. Now, go to Luke chapter 22. So, Jesus is God. Go to Luke chapter 22. Look at verse number 4. Now, the Son, Jesus, is obedient to the Father. The Son, Jesus, was sent by the Father, and he's obedient to the Father. Look at Luke chapter 22. Look what the Bible says. Verse number 40 says, When he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was asking them to come pray with him and stay awake um, with him while he prayed. And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, he kneeled down and prayed. This is Jesus praying, saying, Jesus is praying to the Father, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Now I want to address this idea of separate, separate wills. In uh, the Bible, I think actually personally, and this is why I never would have really preached a sermon like this until I was a pastor, because this is dangerous territory to go into when you're, when you're just a satellite leader. But I mean, I think especially, you know, things that I've heard people say over the last several years, I think too much is made about the separate wills of the three. Um, I, I believe God has one will. I believe that the will of the Father matches the will of the Son, matches the will of the Spirit. Um, you know, I don't believe that there's conflicting, contradicting wills. Um, in Luke chapter 22, what we are seeing here, what we are seeing here is that God, and, and God the Father sent Jesus the Son to do a job on this earth. And what we are seeing demonstrated in Luke chapter 22 is not the separate will of, of you know, the Word or the Son. What we're seeing is the humanity of Christ. Right. What you are seeing is that, is that God was Jesus Christ was fully God, and he was fully man. He was about to be tortured and killed. Right. He was about to be crucified by, you know, one of the most brutal, brutal methods you could possibly even be killed by. And look, you're seeing the humanity of Jesus Christ. And that's important that we see this, because there's heresies that teach, just like I said, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus wasn't God. There's also heresies that teach that Jesus wasn't man. Jesus was fully man and fully God. And what in, in Luke chapter 22, we see the humanity of Christ. We don't see a separate will. We see the humanity of Christ. God the Father wasn't manifest in the flesh. Jesus, the Son, who was God, was manifest in the flesh. And he says, Lord, you know, I, I, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was not wanting to go through that right. as a man. Right. But... Notice how he does it, and he, he asks the question without sinning. And this is a good lesson for us, by the way. He says, you know, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's always how you should pray too, by the way. Right. You can ask questions to God, but always say to God, God, whatever your will is, that's my will. Amen. You know, this is a question I'm asking God. You know, if, if you need me to go through this, that's fine, whatever. Your will be done. Go to Philippians chapter 2 and look at verse number 8. 
Jesus was obedient to the Father. That is clear in the Bible. Look at verse number 8. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is what Jesus was praying about in Luke chapter 22. But he was obedient. Who was he obedient to? So Jesus is clearly the Son, the only begotten Son of God, the Word become flesh, is clearly obedient to the Father. And, I mean, the Bible is super clear about it. He wasn't obedient to the Romans. He wasn't obedient to the Jews. I mean, he was obedient to the Father. He was obedient to the architect that sent him to the earth to do a job. And he was obedient unto death, that job that he had to do. He was always, look, this is just, Luke chapter 22 is showing the perspective of God's will through the human experience. Through the humanity of Christ. Jesus was feeling the pain, the suffering. He was so stressed out about what was happening. You can see it in Luke chapter 22. But he was always obedient to the Father. Right. So, let's look at Jesus, the word summarized here. God was manifest as a man. Jesus was sent to earth. The word was manifest as a man. Jesus was sent to do a job on this earth. The word became flesh. He was, he, he was sent here to live an innocent life that could be given as a sacrifice to appease the wrath of God. That's what Jesus did. No other person, look, this, and God had to do it because no other person could do that. Because no other person could live a life that would be worthy as a sacrifice to God for the sins of the entire world. You know, I say that out, I say that out soul winning. I, I say that with my soul winning partner. I'll tell the, the person at the door, I'll be like, you know what, um, Brother Johannes, he would probably die for me, but he can't die for my sins because he's not innocent. Right. Because we've all sinned. He's sinned, I've sinned, we can't die for each other. It had to be God that did it. That's why God created Jesus and his word became flesh. So God used his word to literally create the world. The second person of the Trinity he used to create the world, and he also used his word to free mankind. Right. Think about that. Think about how beautiful of a design that is. Just using God's word, he created everything, and he frees us using his word. You know, so, out soul winning, you know, I don't explain the Trinity to people out soul winning, by the way. You don't have to go into the Trinity. Right. All you have to do is explain that, you know, God, this is how I usually say it, God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. People need to understand that Jesus Christ was God. Amen. That's what they need to understand. Right. And it's clear, it's clear to understand when you tell people that Jesus lived a perfect life, and that way he could be that perfect sacrifice. But people understand that, because you know what? It makes sense. Amen. It makes sense. It makes sense that it takes an innocent sacrifice to appease the wrath of God, and it also makes sense that that person who can live an entire life without sin is God himself. Right, right. It, it just makes sense. So you don't have to get into the complicated doctrines that we're talking about this morning um, how it's soul winning. People just need to realize that Jesus was God. Right. And he lived a perfect life, and he became the perfect sacrifice. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what people need to realize. He, he was the word that went forth to do the work of redeeming man. That whosoever you know, trusts in that, believes in that, will have eternal or everlasting life. Is what the Bible says. The Holy Ghost. Let's look at the third. The third part of the Trinity. The Holy Ghost. What does he do? Turn to Romans chapter 8. Like he, he does a lot. There's too much for for us to go over here. I'm just going to touch on a few different things, and I'll kind of summarize it, but the Holy Ghost does a lot for us in the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 8. Let's just look at just a couple of things that the Holy Ghost does. Look at Romans chapter 8, and verse number 15. The Bible says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, where we cry, Abba, Father. So, I mean, notice how spirit is a capital S there. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So here's the personhood of the Spirit right here. The, the Spirit itself is a witness. Right. The Spirit is a witness. What's a witness? A witness is a person. You can think of a witness as a person. 
Okay? So there's the personhood of the Spirit. It's basically, the Holy Spirit is basically a spiritual guide for us. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 is a great chapter for the Trinity, especially the work of the Holy Spirit that it does in our lives. But look, it's basically a spiritual guide for us, giving us access. After we've been saved, the Holy Spirit gives us access to the will of God in our lives. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. Look at verse number 9. So Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse number 9, but if you go back to verse number 3, you'll see that the context of verse number 9 that we're going to read now, we're talking about the Father here. We're talking about the Father in Ephesians 1, chapter 9. You can't just grab phrases out of the Bible and just apply them to things. You need to know what the context is, who we're talking about, which, which part of the Godhead we're talking about. In verse number 9, we're talking about the Father. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 9. Let me turn back there. If you read number, verse number 3, it says, Blessed be God, what? And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and in heavenly places in Christ. So this is the context of the verses I'm going to read you. is talking about, you know, thank God for the Father who's blessed us through Jesus. Amen. Because what did he do? How did he bless us through Jesus? Because he sent him. He sent him. He's the one that yet took his word and made it into Jesus. Okay? He manifests Jesus in the flesh. Using it, for, you know, his word became flesh. Look at verse number 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, the Father's will, according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself. So, first of all, since we're talking about God the Father, and we're talking about his will, and then we start to read about Christ and the Holy Spirit here, look, God has one will, folks. There's one will here. We don't need to get weird about that and start, like, people just pick this stuff apart until they just get themselves in a twisted up mess. They make themselves into a trinity pretzel and they don't even know what they're talking about anymore. So God has one will for us, and he uses Christ, and he uses the Holy Spirit to um, get that will known to us and, and deliver it to us. Okay, look at verse number 10. And in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worked all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also trusted. Now he's talking to saved people. He's like, you have also trusted. This is the same thing as saying you believed on. So how do you get saved? You believe on or you trust. If you want to explain to people at the door what believe on means, it doesn't mean I just believe Jesus existed, because the Muslim believes Jesus existed. Yeah. It doesn't even mean you believe Jesus existed and that he was God. It, look, you're trusting in him. By believing on him, you're saying, I trust in him. Trusting in him is 100% or nothing. It's not 90% trust Jesus, 10% think I have to go to church. It, that's not trusting. You're either all trusting Jesus or you're trusting something else. Amen. Okay? So, verse number 13 equates believe on with trust. In whom he also trusted, in Jesus, in Christ, that after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed. Oh, something's happened to you here. Ye were sealed with that what? That Holy Spirit of promise. Something happens to you once you trust in Christ. Look, this is something that actually happens. This is something that physically happens to you. You are spiritually sealed, the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit. That is, that is God. That is the third person of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit is, is given to you, and it seals you after you trust in Jesus. You are literally sealed by God, folks. By the witness of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 14. Which is, now it gets even better. Which is so, God, he, he gives this Holy Spirit to you to seal you, to do a job. And then the Bible says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Until the redemption of the person's possession unto the praise of his glory. So now we see some more detail here. So you trust in Jesus. Here's the process. You trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And the Bible says you are sealed. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. But guess what? He stays with you. It's not like the Holy Spirit comes in and turns some gears and, and tightens some screws. He's like, all right, you're sealed. 
your seal mechanism is done and then he takes off, says, no, he's the earnest of our inheritance. You know what that means? That means that's a down payment. Right. That means he stays with you. Right. He stays with you. And he stays with you. It's a sign. What earnest means, it's a sign of a promise or a down payment on something. Look at verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto the saints, cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So, look, the spirit is there. The spirit seals you. But the spirit is there to do a job in your life. It's there to lead you. Turn to John chapter 16. It's there to lead you. It's there to guide us. Look at John chapter 16 and verse number 13. John chapter 16 and verse number 13. Look what the Bible says. It says, how be it when he... So it, it's a he, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. If you run into these strange people that tell you that, you know, God is a woman or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's... it's yeah, all three persons are a he. Okay? All right. 13, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and he shall show it to you. So, the Spirit is going to come and he's going to guide you in all truth, the Bible says. So, the Spirit, turn to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Actually, I'm going to John chapter, you turn to John, uh, turn to Luke 12, I'll turn to John uh, 14 and just read another verse for you. Just more on what the Spirit will do for you. John chapter 14 and verse number 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, this is Jesus speaking, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. So the Holy Ghost, once again, the Holy Ghost is going to seal you. He's going to, he's going to be with you after you're saved. He's going, to, you know, he's going to be inside you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible is saying there. And then the Bible says he's going to teach you all things. Right. He's going to teach you all things. Sometimes, if you're in Luke chapter 12, look at verse number 11, sometimes, and maybe this hasn't happened to you, but the Bible says that there may be a time in your life that the Holy Spirit will literally tell you what to say. Look at verse number 11 of Luke chapter 12. And I hope that this never happens to any of you um, in this room, but it happened to people in the Bible. Look at verse number 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues and under the magistrates and the powers, and take, no, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. Why? It says when they bring you and they're taking you to trial and they're taking you to execution because you're a Christian and because you believe in Jesus Christ, it's like, you know, most people would be worried, oh man, I'm worried I'm going to yell and scream in pain. I'm worried I'm going to deny Christ. I'm worried that I'm going to do these, you know, say something that I don't believe and that my testimony will be destroyed. But the Bible says, don't worry about any of that because when that time comes, it says in verse number 12, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. The Bible says, in those times, I will give you the words to say. And how does God give you the words to say? It will be the Holy Ghost that delivers those words Amen. to you. Look at Acts chapter 7. This actually happened to Stephen in the Bible. This happened to Stephen in the Bible. Stephen gave this great, miraculous sermon in the Bible before he was killed. And he gave such a powerful sermon. Look, these were normal men, right. folks. These were normal Men, these were working class men. These were fishermen. These were, you know, just tax collectors. These were normal people. These were not great orders. These were not kings. And we're reading about these disciples, these apostles. Look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Stephen gives this miraculous sermon and testimony of Jesus Christ. And look at verse 54. And when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. He gave such a powerful sermon. Was Stephen said some great preacher? Stephen gave some powerful sermon. How did he do it? How in the world did Stephen, a normal guy, just how did he give such a miraculous sermon that just cut everyone to the heart so much so that they killed him for it? Look at verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost filled him and came and just, just gave him the this is this is Luke chapter 12 being fulfilled. Right here, in Acts chapter seven, he looked up steadfastly, and look what God, look what God rewards him with here. 
right before his death. Look what God does for him. Since he, he just has this miraculous sermon that cuts everyone to the heart, he looks up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Look, Jesus stood up for this man. <laughs> Jesus wasn't sitting on the right hand of God. Here, Jesus stood up for Stephen. Amen. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. But there's too much that the Holy Spirit does for us. The most important thing is after we get saved, the Holy Spirit seals us and indwells us. It's a whole sermon series on everything that the Holy Spirit does for us. But essentially, it is the Holy Spirit that God uses to interact with believers. Does that make sense? It's, the, it's God's, think of it this way, it's God's spiritual interface for us. We have the Bible, but we also have the Holy Spirit that is interacting with us. So those are the three parts. Those are just general overviews of the three parts of the Trinity that 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7 talks about. But the confusion that people have with the Trinity is because people don't really understand the being of God. People don't understand God himself. People want to compare God to like a person or a human being. And you can't really do that. I mean, look, look it's, it's not difficult to, three, to see the three parts of the Trinity in the Bible. There's a lot spoken about it. Um, the word Trinity, it's true, it's never used in the Bible. But you can see, you know, the Father, the Word, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit all over the Bible. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. A lot of Bible verses mention the whole Trinity in, in one verse or a couple of verses. As you see in Genesis chapter 1, just the first three verses of the Bible just describes the whole Godhead right there. as all three parts of the Trinity. But look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 2. The elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. That right there talks about how the Trinity basically works for us right there. God, God the Father was the one, look, that we, we can see how they relate to each other. God the Father, as we've seen, he sent the Son, and the Son is obedient to the Father. It was God the Father who had the foreknowledge in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. Look, and the Spirit goes forth representing the Son. But what's hard for people to understand, like I said, turn to John um, chapter 10, is this being called God. Now there are some places in the Bible, and I want to address this just briefly, where Jesus says that I and the Father are, are one. I mean, that, that I'm, the Father and I were the same. That, that's what he says. And I want to explain that um, in a few minutes, because I, I, I think that you know it's worth uh, just looking at that quickly. But look at John chapter 10 and verse number 27. I, I, one of my favorite couple of verses in the Bible right here. John chapter 10, look at verse number 27. Jesus is speaking here. You have a red letter Bible. This is talking about, or Jesus is speaking here. Look at uh, verse number 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. This is Jesus. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Just proving, once again, eternal security. Right here. Once you are saved, once you have trusted on Jesus, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's a done deal. There's nothing you could ever do to lose your salvation. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Look, you're a man. Look, God holds your salvation, not you. And thank God that he holds my salvation. Or I would try, I'm sure I would get rid of it on accident or whatever. Look at verse 29. My father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So Jesus here is saying, you know, my Father holds your salvation. You know, my, my Father holds your salvation. And then in verse number 30, it's like, uh-oh, this, this got Jesus in trouble right here. I and my Father are one. Look, John, uh, Jesus clarifies this in John 14. So what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, I am God. Amen. That's what he's saying. I mean, let's not, like, you know, don't... Don't, wrap your, don't put yourself in a pretzel over this. He's just saying, I and my Father are one, being we're both God. Amen. That's what he's saying. Look at John 14 and verse 10. John 14 and verse 10. Jesus gets into a little bit more detail of this idea that um, he and the Father are one in verse number 10 of John 14. The Bible says, Believe us not that I am in the Father and the Father in me. 
The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Jesus is saying, we're both God. Right. That's what he is saying. He's saying, I am God. That's what Jesus is saying in John 10, 30, and in John 14, verse number 10. Now go to Isaiah chapter 9, and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9, and verse number 6. I'll show you another verse that people really, um, you know, they really have a hard time. I'm not sure why, but some people have a hard time with this one as well. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6 is talking about some of the names of Jesus. Some of the names of Jesus. For unto us, the Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of peace. Now go to Isaiah 63. So people are sitting here and they're saying, okay, is Jesus the Father? It says that Jesus is the everlasting Father. Look, this is talking about the, the name before that is just equating Jesus to the mighty God. Again, proving to the Jehovah's Witness that no, Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus is the mighty God. And then it says the everlasting Father. Look, this is just saying here, Jesus is God. Amen. That's what this is explaining. Look at Isaiah 63. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, Doubtless thou art our father through Abraham, be it, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. This Isaiah 63 is kind of the flip of Isaiah chapter 9. Meaning in Isaiah chapter 9, it's talking about the names of Jesus. Look down at Isaiah 63, and I'll explain this to you. Verse number 16. Is God the Father really the redeemer? Well, what, you, you can, what? Jesus is, is, is God the Father, the Redeemer? Well, he sent the Redeemer. Right. Jesus is the one that actually did the redeeming. But yeah, God the Father is the Redeemer. See how you can say those things and they're both true? Yep. So God the Father sent Jesus the Son to do the redeeming. And in Isaiah 63, so Isaiah does this. Right. Is what I'm trying to say. Isaiah does this. It says, God the Father is our Redeemer. And in Isaiah chapter 9, it says, Jesus is the everlasting Father. Because it's just saying, look, they're, they're God. Yeah. That's what it's saying. That's, that's, the, that's the way Isaiah describes God. And that's the way Isaiah does it. So he does it calling the Father the Redeemer. And you can, you can take that and be like, see, Jesus is the Father. And the Father is Jesus. And be like, nah. no. It's just saying that, that they're both God, is what it's saying. Okay? It's, it's still talking about the Trinity is still valid. The Father sent the Son. The Father sends the Holy Spirit to be a, a witness or an ambassador um, in the Son's name. It, it all works. So it's just talking about in Isaiah 63 how the Father redeemed us. And it, it's the way he did it was through Jesus. Okay, and the same thing is, is, is in Isaiah chapter 9. The everlasting Father just saying that this Jesus Christ is God. He is deity. He is God. So look, they are, I mean, it's hard to understand this being of God. That's why people have a hard time with the Trinity is because, you know, the being of God, when you think of like a being, or, you know, creation in our own image, you know, something that is like, we want to think of a person. We want to think of a human being. But God is not us. His word is different from us. So people come up with analogies. So people come up with analogies to describe the Trinity, and every single analogy has problems, right? It has problems because an analogy is really, you're trying to compare two things. So when I come up with an analogy, and I'm going to tell you my analogy that I've always thought of things, and I'm sure there's some kind of problem that you could probably find with. But it's just a way that we come up with to compare something we know with something that we have to find hard to understand. And the problem is, if you take something that you know, like this mortal world that we live in, and you try to describe an infinite being like God, there's, it's just not going to match perfectly. That's, that's the problem. But we want to think of God like us, but he's not like us. You know, my words are not like God's words. I can't create things with my words. You know, God can do that. You know, so his words, he used to, they have actual power. That's one difference. You know, we need to think about that when you think about the, the seriousness of reading your Bible, by the way. You think about just the difference between God's words and our words. That God can actually use his word to create the universe and actually, actually save your soul. And then he's also given it to you and you never read it. Right. So that's something to think about right there. 
You know, His Spirit, He uses to adopt us, to seal us, to guide us. You know, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and that ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So it's talking about, you know, your, 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 the Holy Ghost in verse number 19, and it's saying your spirit, you know, in verse number 20. So the Spirit of God, when He seals you, and He gives you that down payment, the Spirit of God, if you're saved this morning, the Spirit of God is inside you. Right. And your spirit, what you want to do, you know, your flesh, as the Bible would call it in, in Romans, you know, is warring against, you know, that Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 30, the Bible says, you can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. If your spirit wins, if your flesh, what you want to do, you want to go sing, you want to go do something, you want to go just, you know, go against what the Bible says, you want to, you know, get out of the Bible and get unspiritual in your life. Look, the Holy Spirit's still in you, you're still sealed, but the Holy Spirit's going to be grieved inside you. So the Spirit is this miraculous way that God the Father uses to interface with us. Think about like a computer interface for like all you, you know, PC guys out there. You know, it's, it's, it's the way God uses to interact with us. It's his spiritual interface. So the way I've always thought about it was kind of, it's kind of based on, you know, Psalm 33 talking about the potter. I always thought about it this way. Here's my analogy. God the Father is the architect. And I've already kind of used that word a few times. He's the architect. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you know, the Bible says that he had the foreknowledge. The Father is the one that had the foreknowledge. It was his plan. Look, word, think about this. Words can't be spoken until the mind decides to speak them, right? right? So, I mean, I think of words, and then I speak those words. So God the Father is the one that decided to speak the words to create the universe. He decided to, you know, come up with this plan of salvation. Look, it is God the Father who is the architect that built the plan of salvation. I mean, the plan of salvation could have been anything. It could have been, you know, if you... Um, it could be anything. If you do these ten works five times in your life, then you can be saved. That could have been the plan, but that's not the plan. The plan instead is belief alone. But, so, God the Father is the architect of everything. He's the architect of the universe, and he's the architect of our salvation. That's how I think about it. Jesus, Jesus is the construction crew. That's kind of how I always thought about it. You know, Jesus is the one that came down here. First of all, he's the one He's the one that built the universe through the words. He was the word. And then Jesus is also the one that came down here to execute the plan of salvation that the architect came up with. He came down here and he did the work. He actually put that plan into place. And he was obedient, but that plan cost him his life. That plan put him through a horrible death. But he was obedient to the Father who sent him to, to execute that plan. He's the one that came here to actually make it happen. Live a perfect life. I think that, I mean, none of you can do that. None of us can do that. Jesus is the one that came here and made that happen. Perform all these miracles, raise people from the dead, just execute this, this plan that the architect had in place. Die on the cross, be buried, rise again the third day. But look, and, and also be the one who people need to trust in. Jesus was the one that made that happen. For God to grant them eternal life. And the Spirit, what's the Spirit? The Spirit is the tools, the interface that God has with us. That once that trust happens and once you're, you know, once you're saved, the Holy Spirit is the tool God uses to seal you. It's the down payment God uses to put down on you. To guarantee that promise of eternal life that He gives you. you know, look, it makes perfect sense how the Trinity um, works together for the salvation of mankind. That's not that difficult to understand. It's actually brilliant when you look at the whole plan and how it all played out. I'm glad it exists. I'm glad it exists. But it works. Look, go to Isaiah chapter 55. But how all that looks, how all that works together and looks as one being called God, you know, that's kind of like where we're just like, whoa. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, folks. Let me put you at ease a little bit this morning. 
You know, it's, it's just the, the trinity, the plan, the architect, the construction crew, the interface God uses with us, with the Holy Spirit. That's brilliant. That's great. That's awesome how God has this working for us and he gives us these opportunities and how he's done that by creating the world, creating our salvation plan and all that. That's great. How does this all fit together and look like, you know, with, with one God? Look at Isaiah 55 and verse number 8. Look, folks, this Bible right here, this, we don't have to understand all of God. Right. This Bible is what God wants us to know about him. Right. That's it. And if you want to know about God, read these words that he has given us, that he has preserved for us. Look at Isaiah 55 and verse 8. The Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. What do you mean? Okay, I get that. God's thoughts are better than mine. You know, God's thoughts are not my, my ways are not his ways. I get all that. And he's saying, look, here's the deal. Here's the deal, mankind. Here's the deal, man and woman on the earth. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. God's saying, look, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It's like, you are just not going to understand everything about me. And what I want you to understand about me, I preserved for you right here. That's what God says. So look, some things just need to be taken on faith. You don't have to sit here and try to like fill in every gap that God didn't tell you. There's some things in the Bible, and I point those things out as much as I possibly can when we preach sermons, or when I preach sermons up here. It's like, you know what? The Bible doesn't want to tell us that. So don't fill in the blanks. Three persons, one God. That's it. And look, it's brilliant how those three parts or distinct individuals secured your eternal life. It's brilliant how God does that. And not only that, but how he uses that Holy Spirit to interface with us and interact with us as we live our lives on this earth. It's brilliant. And then other things, you know, we go up to God and we get to heaven and be like, hey, don't start a sentence with the word hey. Or don't go up to God and say, hey. But go up, you know, go and ask God, how does all this work when you get to heaven? There's nothing wrong with, with taking things on faith. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.